hemorrhage and hypotension. Hemorrhage and hypotension. So what if you hemorrhage and you lose a lot of blood? If that happens, blood pressure is going to drop. And this looks like a pretty complicated chart until you realize we pretty much have gone over everything on here. We're just showing the body's mechanisms that are in place to compensate for the drop in blood pressure. So, right, if, if blood pressure goes down, arterial pressure decreases, you're gonna have decreased firing of the baroreceptors, and now we're gonna have the medullary reflexes begin. I'm gonna use my arrow since my pointer doesn't seem to wanna work today. So, let's look at all these things. There's nothing really new on this, folks. We've, we've talked about this. So, the medulla is gonna say, well, decrease the parasympathetic discharge to the heart. What will that do? Not only increase heart rate, you have less parasympathetic activity. Let's increase sympathetic discharge to the heart. What will that do? Well, that'll increase heart rate. Right? Let's increase sympathetic uh, outflow to the, the heart muscle, right? Positive inotropic, that's gonna increase cardiac contractility. Let's increase sympathetic discharge to the veins. That's gonna cause venous pressure to go up. That will increase venous return. And that will increase in diastolic volume increasing stroke volume, right? So these factors are gonna affect cardiac output. Increase heart rate, increase stroke volume, we increase cardiac output. And then finally, way off here to the right, if we increase uh, sympathetic discharge to the arterioles, they're gonna constrict, and as we constrict, we get increased peripheral resistance, and if we increase peripheral resistance and we increase cardiac output, mean arterial pressure will come up. We've done all of this before. Um, to the left of the chart, it says a decrease in arterial pressure is a decrease in firing by... Yeah, because, right, the baroreceptors are there to, to, to respond to increased pressure. Oh, so they only respond to increase. Well, but, but in a sense, right, they also respond to a decrease then. So if they respond to an increased pressure and tell the medulla, don't do as much, then if pressure's dropping, they'll say, hey, pressure's dropping, the medulla says, I better do more. So this is a positive feedback system. Uh, not really, it's a negative feedback system, right? So the problem was that pressure dropped, what do we want to do? We want to bring pressure back up. But that makes you hemorrhage more. Uh, well, we're, we're gonna assume it's that the clot's forming somewhere, but the body doesn't have any other thing to do, right? It's got to try to, to stop the drop in blood pressure, which will bring about shock if we don't stop that. So let's talk about shock. Shock is due to an inadequate blood supply to our tissues. There are lots of causes of shock. The first one I have listed up there is myocardial infarction. So if you have a heart attack, right, myocardial infarct, and the wall of the heart loses its ability to contract, less blood will be pushed out, and if less blood gets pushed out, less will come back to the heart. If less blood comes back to the heart, the heart will push out less blood, and less blood will come back to the heart. If less blood comes back to the heart, less blood gets pushed out, a downward spiral, right? So we're spiraling downward here due to an MI. That's a positive feedback. That one is a positive feedback. Uh, low venous return can cause shock. Well, one cause of low venous return would be hypovolemia. We can figure out what that word means. Low blood volume. Right? Hypovolemia, low blood volume. Well, there are lots of things that can cause low blood volume. One of them, of course, would be hemorrhage. You could also have severe dehydration. Right? You could also have third degree burns where people lose fluid, right? Causing hypovolemia. Another cause of low venous return is venous pooling a pooling of the blood out in the veins. So most of your blood, I told you, is out in your veins right now. If the veins lose their normal tone, blood will pool in the periphery in those veins. And there are a couple of things that can do that. One of those is something that we call psychogenic effects. So coming from the brain. Classic example, you're on your way home today and you see somebody that's just been in an accident. So you pull over, 
and unfortunately one person's dead, the other person seems to be fine. There doesn't seem to be any injuries, internal injuries or otherwise, but you could tell they're going into shock. Why are they going into shock? Nothing's wrong with them. Psychogenic, right? So their brain is starting to shut down the body even though they have not been uh, injured because of the psychological effects of, of the, the accident. Allergic reactions can cause venous pooling. If the person has a body-wide allergic reaction, blood vessels dilate. Body-wide, blood will pool in the periphery. This is not a first aid course, but a couple of obvious treatment things here, folks. Don't stand the person up and walk them around. If you stand them up, where's the blood going to go? Down to the legs, right? We don't want it down there. So keep them lying down. If they're not injured, you can elevate their legs slightly, right, to bring blood back. You want to keep them warm, but don't let them get hot, because if they get hot, blood vessels dilate. All right, so keep them warm, elevate the feet. I hesitate to even say the last one. People never think of this anymore. But when I was a kid growing up, it was standard. You'd see it in movies all the time. So, oh, well, they're going to shop. Give them a shot of whiskey. Right? Give them some alcohol. That'll snap them out of it. Well, alcohol is a dilator of blood vessels. So, no, don't give them any alcohol. Erin? <laughs> you have a question? Why did your hands start to sweat like, when that happens to you? Yeah, so this is an, all a sympathetic response. It's a sympathetic response. Uh, Couple more things here. Upright posture, not an abnormality, but when you stand up, blood tends to pool in the legs. And the body has to respond to that by constricting blood vessels, the veins, and constricting arterioles to try to keep the blood pressure up. All of you have experienced getting out of bed too quickly, where you go, whoa, right? And you start to feel a little faint because the blood tends to go down low and the body hasn't been able to respond quickly enough to constrict those blood vessels. Exercise, certainly not a, an abnormality, but I do like to mention here that when you start to exercise, all kinds of bodily changes have to occur. Uh, you increase the flow of blood back to the heart because your skeletal muscle pump starts to work. The heart starts to contract more strongly due to that Starling's law. Sympathetic discharge will start to increase heart rate and cause uh, stronger contractions. Uh, blood pressure starts to go up, and obviously there have to be overrides that say this is okay that blood pressure goes up, right? Because normally we'd want to keep that blood pressure under control. Um, cardiac output go up dramatically. I mentioned this before, but from five liters per minute up to 35 liters per minute during strenuous exercise. Uh, and then a couple of words here about congestive heart failure. Um, Congestive heart failure is a general term that means Starling's law is being broken. Okay. Starling's law is being broken. Uh, they should write, write him a ticket or something because Starling's law is being broken. So remember, the heart's supposed to pump all the blood that comes to it. But in congestive heart failure, the heart loses its ability to push out all of the blood that has come to it. The wall of the heart has become weakened for lots of different reasons. Could be due to an MI, all kinds of different things. One of the things that's very interesting about congestive heart failure is that the body's normal mechanisms for compensating are actually contradictory, all right, for what the body needs. So let's think for a minute. Your left heart, let's say, is starting to fail. It's not able to pump all the blood that comes to it. Less blood will be going out to your kidneys. Your kidneys will start saying, we're ischemic. We already know what happens then, right? We start to get the renin angiotensin mechanism, increased sodium retention and increased water retention, increasing blood volume. Well, already the heart can't pump all of the blood that's coming to it. And yet you're retaining even more fluid. When angiotensin II is released, you cause vasoconstriction. So you're going to get constriction of the arterioles. Well, already the heart is having a hard time pushing against the blood that's out in the periphery. And now you're going to start increasing peripheral resistance. This is going to make matters even worse. Positive feedback. It's positive feedback in this case. Um, 
So to help people that have congestive heart failure, uh, there are things that they can do that can dramatically help them. One of the easiest things that they can do is they can simply give them a diuretic. Uh, so the patient shows up at the hospital, they give them a diuretic, and it's dramatic, right? Within a few hours, the patient is much, much better because they've lost the, the fluid that they're holding on to. Uh, additionally, they can use um, a very old drug, but still around and very effective, digitalis. Or varieties of variations of digitalis. Digitalis has a positive inotropic effect on the heart. Okay? It has a positive inotropic effect on the heart. We know that that means the heart will contract more strongly. Right? So it helps the, the heart pump that blood out. Um, I'll leave it at, at that. So, uh, Diuretics, digitalis, there are other drugs that are, are used, but, but there's a, a few. Before I, I leave congestive heart failure, let's think for a minute that what if the person has congestive heart failure on their left side, but not on their right, right? So for some reason, the wall of the heart got damaged on the left side, but not on the right. Heart attack, right? So now they have congestive heart failure on the left. They're not pumping all the blood that they should, when the right heart keeps pumping, what's between the right heart and the left heart? The lungs. The lungs. And so the right heart's trying to pump the blood to the left heart, but the left heart is acting like a dam. And because it's acting like a dam, the capillary hydrostatic pressure in the lungs goes up. And where, if you have increased capillary hydrostatic pressure, fluid's gonna start coming out of the capillaries, and where will it go? Into the, into the lungs, all right? So you start to cause the person to accumulate fluid in their lungs because their heart is not able to pump all the blood that, that's coming to them. Years ago, uh, they used to bring a, um, a trailer on the campus for, for all the faculty and staff to go and have a physical, right? So they'd bring it on campus for a few days and you'd go through there and they would run all kinds of tests on you. But before you ever went, you had to fill out a questionnaire. And in the questionnaire, I was always amazed they had a question that said, how many pillows do you use? It's like, how many pillows do I use? What do you care? I like pillows, <laughs> right? Uh, there was a reason why they were asking how many pillows that you're using. Because sometimes patients uh, show up at the doctor's office, they present at the doctor's office, and their chief complaint is that they can't sleep lying down. They're having to sleep sitting up with a bunch of pillows behind them. Can you kind of guess what's happening? Right. Remember at night, when you're horizontal, the fluid that's down in your legs gets picked up and gets dumped back into the circulatory system. So if they have congestive heart failure, during the day maybe they're all right because the fluid's down here in the legs. At night, they're horizontal, the fluid gets regathered, pressure increases in the cardiovascular system, fluid starts to leak into the lungs and the person starts having a hard time breathing right? because of the, the congestive heart failure. Okay, uh, I think this is our last slide on this and then we can draw our line, which is not very good. But that's all right, we'll finish the cardiovascular system, right? It'll be good. Fetal circulation, certainly not an abnormality for us, but an abnormality, uh, or not an abnormality for a fetus, but it would be an abnormality for us as, as an adult. So you learned in anatomy that a fetus has two important modifications in its heart because a fetus doesn't breathe, right? There's no air to breathe. So we don't want blood to go to the pulmonary circuit. We want it to only go to the systemic circuit. So there are two bypasses to stop blood from going to the, the pulmonary circuit. The first one is a hole between the right atrium and left atrium that we call the foramen ovale. Right? So it's between the right atrium and left atrium. When blood comes back from the vena cava into the right atrium, it goes over to the left atrium, bypassing the right ventricle. Okay? So that's the foramen ovale. The second bypass is between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So let's hear it. some blood does still get down into that right ventricle, when it comes out that pulmonary artery, we want to get rid of that 
And so there is a small connection here, they're showing it right there, called the ductus arteriosus. And that's a shunt between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So that any blood that does go to the right ventricle can be shunted to the aorta. At birth, all of that has to change. Right? So when the baby takes its first breath, the lungs expand, and now the baby is breathing. We don't want to shunt blood away from the pulmonary circuit. So when they take their first breath, a little flap will close over the foramen ovale, and the ductus arteriosus constricts. Sometimes when the baby's born, the foramen ovale doesn't close completely. When the neonatal nurse or, or obstetrician listens to the baby's heart, they'll hear murmurs as blood leaks from the right atrium into the left atrium. Pretty common for that not to be all the way closed. They'll hear a slight murmur. If it's severe, the baby's going to have to have open heart surgery to close the opened foramen ovale. Okay, draw your line. That's, that's it for the exam.